you. So thank you, Abigail. And welcome to all of you who are joining us today for the lecture. This lecture is part of the library spring, spring lecture series, highlighting the treasures of the HUC library collection, featuring leading scholars who will share their expertise with us. With over 1 million items, including books, manuscript, manuscripts, microfilms, maps, board size, book plates, music scores, stamps, and much more, the HUC libraries have the largest Judaica collection in the Western Hemisphere and is second in size only to the Judaica collection at the National Library of Israel. Today, Dr. Dr. Joshua Tepelitsky will lecture on the Kashrut community and control, Shrita manuals and their afterlife in her early modern Europe. The Cloud Library owns many Shrita manuals, books and manuscripts. Some of them are extremely rare since, they are, since the books themselves are very thin and small. This is an example of our unique collection, which spans to full spectrum of subjects, languages, and geographical locations. This lecture was sponsored by the Bibliographical Society of America. I would like to thank the B BSA for their support and ask Dr. Jean Mary Musto to introduce our speaker today. Jean, you're muted now. Yes, but I can't unmute. I you're, can't. you're good. You're set. You're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> Hello. On behalf of the Bibliographical Society of America, I would also like to join Yoram in uh, welcoming you to this talk, which we are pleased to be co-sponsoring with HUCJIR. The Bibliographical Society is an international interdisciplinary organization that fosters the study of books in traditional and emerging formats. BSA pursues this mission through supporting public programs such as this and research through its publications and through collaborating with like-minded organizations. The society is committed to equity and inclusion in all its programs and is open to all those interested in bibliographical problems and projects. I'm honored to introduce our speaker today, Joshua Tuplitsky, who is an associate professor in the Department of History at Stony Brook SUNY, where he researches and teaches about Jewish life in Central Europe in the early modern period. His book, Prince of the Press, How One Collector Built History's Most Enduring and Remarkable Jewish Library, was published in 2019 and was awarded the Salo Baron Prize of the AAJR for Best First Book in Jewish Studies in 2019 and the 2020 Jordan Schnitzer Book Award of the Association for Jewish Studies and was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. He is an associate editor of the forthcoming Encyclopedia of Jewish Book Cultures. He also co-leads a digital humanities project called Footprints, Jewish Books Through Time and Place, which tracks the movement of Jewish books since the inception of print. Currently, he is working on a book that reconstructs a plague epidemic in 18th century Prague and its impact on Jewish social and cultural life in the city. And so thank you, Joshua. Thank you, thank you. I'll just ask you to bear with me for a moment while I share my screen and then we'll begin. Very good, thank you, thank you. 
Um, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to begin by offering my thanks uh, to Jean-Marie Mousteau and to A.J. Berkowitz, who kindly extended this invitation to me to come and speak to you all uh, what feels like a lifetime ago <laughs> when we thought that this event might be comfortably held in person today. Um, we're still not, but, but I'm, I'm really overjoyed to see the large number of participants and delighted by the opportunity uh, that we have also been offered to continue to, to learn and study together over Zoom and to convene uh, well over 200 people in this Zoom room together uh, to, to study and explore this topic together. Uh, my thanks also uh, to the staff of the HUC libraries, to Jorn Biton, to Abigail Bacon, and to Jordan Finken, who provided wonderful resources from HUC's collection, which has enriched this work in progress. And my thanks to the BSA for its support for this event. Um, as you can see, I'll be, I'll be sharing slides throughout. Um, people are, uh, of course, muted, but welcome to share their questions and comments on the side, which we'll be collecting and hopefully have some time to address at the end. And with that, we'll get started. In the year 1730, the Moravian rabbi and memoirist Pinchas Katzenellenbogen awoke from a dream in which he peered from the window of his bedroom onto the street below to see a mad dog running there, followed by a group of boys who were taunting the dog with calls and pelting it with stones. Recording this episode in his memoirs later, Katzenellenbogen recalled remarking to himself that, quote, this dog is a reincarnation of a shochet, a ritual slaughterer from this city, end quote. Basing his interpretation of the dream on a book that had enumerated and interpreted the 613 Jewish commandments. The work entitled Ir Miklat, which means city of refuge, had warned that a butcher, or rather a shochet, who conducted his task with a flawed knife would receive cosmic punishment in the form of death by disease, something we're all too familiar with in our time, followed by reincarnation, either as a dog that feeds upon unkosher carcasses or as a kosher animal whose fate would be to be butchered in an unkosher fashion. Punishments that fit the crime of having produced unfit food during the lifetime of the shochet. Yet Katzen Ellenbogen was perplexed, for the shochet in question, the one that the dream must have been about, was a licensed practitioner. He was not just a man with a knife, but rather he was the bearer of documentation signed by experts in his field, attesting to his skill and certification. In Katzen Ellenbogen's words again, I quote, that man had several kabbalot, and we're going to get to the meaning of this word shortly. That man had several kabbalot, and the first kabbalah was from 1689, and among them many of the great sages that had been in the province of Schwarzburg, and also from one rabbi in other provinces, end quote. Katzen Ellenbogen was describing a system and its abuses, the system of the kabbalah for shechita a form of authorization and certification of Jewish ritual butchers, or shochtim. That system was made of rabbis, teachers, communal leaders, consumers, and as I'll contend in this lecture today, books played an active role in that system. As we shall see today, books for conducting shechita were printed in a remarkable number of editions during the early modern period. Between the years 1530 and 1799, some 186 separate printings were conducted in Central and Eastern Europe and Venice, and that may be a conservative estimate depending on how you count. I should pause now and note that the, the lion's share of today's examples are going to come from Central Europe. There will be um, many uh, reasons to raise questions about comparative contexts between Ashkenazic and Sephardic Jews. Um, Jews of different regions, but I'm going to confine my discussion today to books that were produced primarily in a central European milieu. The regular production of these books suggests a market demand and a cultural expectation that no shochet would be without one of these books. But the history of this system does not end with the books leaving the printing press. Rather, surviving copies of printed books grant us a window into the ways that Shochtim used these books, not strictly or even solely as reference materials, 
but also as documentation in an info system of authority and license in daily life in Jewish communities across Central and Eastern Europe. Now, as I've already hinted to, today's lecture is a work in progress. It's part of ongoing research about the way books were used after they were printed and about exploring the transmission of specialized knowledge about early modern Jewish practice through examining material texts. In today's discussion, we'll use the prefaces to printed books, which we'll call paratextual material, alongside manuscript inscri inscriptions, and we'll complement those with discussions based on narrative sources, observations by Jews and Christians alike, as well as legal prescriptions, memoirs, and communal statutes, in order to make a contribution through a case study to a conversation about the relationship between knowing and doing in books, study, and in our case, the production of kosher meat in early modern Europe. Whereas in later periods, questions over ritual slaughter would form a breaking point, point between different movements within Judaism, the stakes in kosher meat production were important long before the onset of religious modernity. At critical moments in the 18th through 20th centuries, which is beyond the scope of our discussion, but I want to just gesture towards it, controversies over kosher meat production roiled Jewish communities of Central Europe, often serving, Central and Eastern Europe, I should say, often serving as a flashpoint for debates over communal autonomy, religious fidelity, citizenship, state power, and Jewish difference itself. In today's paper, I'll be interested not in debates over the practice of shechita per se, but rather in documentary efforts to tame the regulation of its practitioners. I'll say that again, documentary efforts to tame the practitioners at a time when Jews were largely left to regulate their own communal and ritual affairs. The meeting place between print and manuscript in these handbooks maintains them as living texts and importantly, as objects of regulation by a closed group of specialists, marking a small, but I contend significant domain of rabbinic authority in a climate marked by complex relations between Jewish religious and political elites. Shrita manuals belong to a wider process of committing ritual practice to text, beginning in the later Middle Ages and then in the age of print and their dissemination in printed form. The 13th century, for example, saw significant advances in the use of texts for secular and religious purposes among both Christians and Jews as administrators increased the output of paper knowledge and the cultural value of the written word was elevated. Handbooks of canon law circulated by the 12th century and increased after the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, um, as, as these councils required, in this case, Christian cases, required heightened supervision and expertise by priests to conduct um, confessions and administer the sacraments. In Jewish communities, the appearance of uh, increased writing and, and handbooks of this nature coincided with the specialization of salaried communal functions, as well as with mounting pressures by royal and ecclesiastical institutions against Jewish life and literature. In reflecting on this genre of writing, which also included handbooks on circumcision, for example, on scribal activity, on menstrual purity, uh, so in reflecting on the genre of writing, the masterful Israeli scholar Israel Tashma distinguished these books and their authors from previous authorities in the Ashkenazic sphere. Whereas writers of the high Middle Ages tended to display expertise across a range of topics and texts, the writers of these 13th century manuals were distinguished by their tightly circumscribed area of knowledge. Their works tended not to reference uh, centuries-long classical literature of Talmud, but rather focused on the literature and output of their immediate predecessors, the decisors of the 12th and 13th centuries. They were designed neither strictly for do-it-yourself home use, nor on the other hand, for study for its own sake in Talmudic academies, but rather occupied a specialized middle ground for practical use by specialist functionaries, themselves a newly professionalized sector of the Jewish communal apparatus. In the early modern period, the shochet was one professional profile among several. Memoiristic writing of the early modern period appreciated um, the social and intellectual profile of the shochet as somebody who undertook his craft in tandem with, un with other roles, but who ranked somewhat beneath the intellectual, religious, and political elites that held sway over Jewish collective life. 
For example, an anonymous memoir from Bohemia in the 17th century um, reports uh, or provides a report by a young man about the education of his elder brother, which consisted of, quote, Haggadic literature or Agadic literature, such as Rashi and Midrashim, as well as the laws of Shrita, end quote, revealing that a combined diet of stories and practical law sufficed for this specialized role, rather than one steeped, for example, in legal codes and, and, and treatises. A similar sense is evinced in a guide for cantors that was published in Offenbach in the year 1718 in which the author refers to working as a shochet as a means to supplement his profession as a cantor. The author in instructing cantors about best practices reminds them to maintain separate clothing for the messy task of shrita, writing, quote, do not pray in the same garment that is always soiled with blood, end quote, and notes with relish in his autobiographical aside, his elevation to a cantorial position that freed him of the burden of working as a shochet on the side suggesting that at least for this individual, there was a kind of preferential hierarchy of communal professions, that it would be preferred to be a, um, a cantor over a shochet, for example, that a rabbi would rank higher, that a judge would rank higher, a preacher would rank higher. There's a, there seems to be this intra-communal hierarchy over the different paraprofessionals of the kehillah. That different professional activities could overlap in the hands of these practitioners is attested to by the form of surviving handbooks of the era. Um, on one octavo volume of the Laws of Shrita that I consulted in preparation for this talk is bound with several other titles, among them a handbook for circumcision to be conducted by a moel. So a moel and a shochet might sometimes be the same person wearing different hats and hopefully using different knives uh, during their activities as well. The most important contribution to the practical laws of Shrita was the book Shritot Uvedikot by Rabbi Jacob Weil, who lived and taught in Germany in the first half of the 15th century before the age of print. Weil was active in Nuremberg, Erfurt, Bamberg, and Augsburg, and authored a number of important responsa and writings for Jewish life in late medieval Europe. He himself was a disciple of Rabbi Jacob or Jakob Moylin, who had himself been opposed to the production of handbooks and to the fragmentation of ritual expertise into these specialized silos. Yet Weil produced a work that would soon become crucial for the training of Shochetim and would become in the streets after his death a recurring product of early modern print houses. The volume itself was brief. These printed volumes could run to fewer than 10 pages and the work is actually two titles, although they are often printed and bound together, framed usually by identical title pages. Um, some copies include one or the other. Some libraries hold only one or the other of Shritot or Bidikot. Um, some bibliographies are careful to distinguish them where possible, and sometimes they are clustered together. The first is the laws of Shrita. The second, the laws of Bidikot, or the examination of the organs, a part of the process of ensuring that meat is suitable for kosher consumption. I should also note as an aside that the book was not the only one dealing with kosher food preparation. Longer, longer treatises continue to appear um, in the age of print, in the 16th century, in the year 1555, for example, a book was written called Sefer Yisur uh, which alongside other uh, parts of uh, kosher food preparation discussed the laws of Shrita, as well as adopting a more expansive scope, talking about bread, milk, vegetables. Books of that nature were probably designed for uh, intellectual elites, for rabbinic decision makers or decisors, rather than for the technicians, for the shochet themselves. Uh, beyond the boundaries of the Ashkenazic sphere, works on slaughtering were also published in the first half of the 16th century. A 1541 book uh, was printed in Constantinople by Mordechai ben Abraham Tivoli called Shritot Uvedikot as well, and it has a very, very different character and flavor to it. Um, and so I think for today, I'm going to maintain my focus strictly on the afterlives of the publication of these books by Rabbi Jacob Weil, who again lived before the age of print, but the print era gave these books a, a tremendous life. The appearance of this book in the age of print was part of the fabric of 16th century culture, which witnessed an explosion of printing of almanacs, guides, and assorted handbooks 
in the vernacular to which we shall return as the new medium found new markets. We can offer something of a sense of the demand, either actual or anticipated by publishers by enumerating the number of editions that were produced between 1500 and 1800. I said this before, but I'm going to repeat it here because I think it's just so telling to see the welter of editions. A search in the bibliography of the Hebrew book, an invaluable resource for um, Hebrew bibliography, a search in the bibliography of the Hebrew book just for the name Jacob Weil or Yaakov Weil yields 239 results. And of those, 186 were produced between the first printing in 1530 and 1799. So a, a period of approximately 250 years. And after about 1800, another 53 books are produced in that 200 year period after 1800, which leads me to call this something of a bestseller of the early modern period. It, it diminishes, it is um, replaced or supplanted by other works in the 19th century that become standard parts of the Shrita curriculum. But in the 270 years or so between the first edition in 1530 and the start of the 19th century, over 200 editions or expressions of this work were produced, which is practically the equivalent of a printing every year and a half on average. That's an awful lot. That's an awful lot. As I say, the first edition appears to have been printed in the year 1530 or around 1533 in Prague, although the dating and placing of this edition is somewhat uncertain. At mid-century, printings of the work began in Italy, which was at the time the premier site for the production of Hebrew books. Um, in 1544, an edition was published in Venice. In 1549, the handbook was printed as part of a larger book of Vile's Responsa, but by 1551, it had been separated out as an independent publication. It was printed in 1556 in Mantua and was reissued again in 1560, 1563, and 1570. Uh, when the text was printed again in Venice in the spring of 1574, I'm gonna... I'm going to set up just a different slide for us. When it was printed again in Venice in the spring of 1574, it included a new feature, a precy of the laws of Shrita, which the publishers explained had been printed numerous times in prayer books of Sephardic Jews. So we're seeing, although I, uh, I started with a disclaimer, that this was going to be an exclusively Ashkenazic talk, you'll notice along the way, I'm trying to gesture towards moments of engagement or interaction across the Ashkenazic Sephardic divide, and in particular in the city of Venice, those bridges, uh, in the city of canals, those bridges were built. A significant milestone in the publication of the work came in the year 1577, in the slide you see before you, with the first publication of the work in Eastern Europe. This edition introduced a commentary glosses of Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch ben Yitzhak Yaakov Buchner that would soon become standard for nearly all future editions. In his introduction to the edition, Tzvi expounded on the virtue of experience or nisayon, marshalling biblical verses regarding God's testing of Abraham as evidence of the importance of examinations for technical proficiency. Tzvi reported on his own expertise in this labor and craft, uh, telling his readers that he had 22 years of hands-on experience in the city of Krakow. Tzvi noted that this was all the more important given the explanation of one dimension of expertise that he felt required elaboration. Experience, Tzvi suggested, ought not to be practiced in secrecy, but rather should be displayed as a tool of public wonder. Svi was thus on the one hand expressing the indispensability of hands-on expertise that had no substitute for years of direct personal acquisition, and on the other hand suggesting that the fruits of such experience should not be monopolized, but rather they should be open to observation by non-specialists. This edition went through multiple reprintings, uh, first in Krakow in 1580, uh, a process that took uh, a month uh, Okay. According to the printer's colophon, again in 1584, and then in other locations, it was printed in Basel in 1601 or 02. Um, and Bookner's glosses to the text accompany the main page, as in other printings of this period and thereafter, which viewers may recognize. Let me see if I've. Should be quiet here. 
uh, which viewers may recognize as familiar uh, as in the pages of the Talmud or other texts that are accompanied by accretions of commentary. Yet even in his ex defense of experience and technical expertise, Tzvi was careful to position himself with respect to learned authority, adding, quote, whenever a new situation came before me, I would show the matters to the great sage, the Reish Tifta, that is to say the Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi Moses Israelis, the Ramah, the author of the glosses on the Shulchan Aruch, or Code of Jewish Law, and I would debate the matters with him and others. Moses Israelis was among the most important and acclaimed scholars of Jewish law of the 16th century, author of a commentary to the Code of Jewish Law that came to serve as the canonical legal text across Central and Eastern Europe for Jews. And Svi's association with him ensured that this work was grounded in intellectual tradition and legal heft. Svi's brief excursus cut to the quick of tensions of the early modern practices of the technical arts, which navigated between the importance of the received wisdom of authority and book learning, but also the indispensability of direct hands-on encounter with the materials of expertise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Printers and publishers continue to issue new editions of the work, often affixing paratextual material to justify the reasons for their enterprises. Building their books around the core texts of Vile's ruling, figuratively and literally. Uh, let me see, I think my, my slides have moved a bit out of order. Um, building their books around the core text of Vile's ruling, both figuratively and literally, the layout of the page generally placed Vile's text at the center or near the center of the page and framed it with commentary. Few of the authors made claims of literal uh, or literary originality. Excuse me. Should be able to shrink this. in just a moment. I want to make this smaller so that you can see the, the screen in front of you. There we go. Far better. Far, far better. <clears throat> Rather, consistent with the early modern modes of Jewish book production, each new edition explained the contributions as, as kind of recoveries of ancient texts or exposure to more recent authorities, material enhancements of type or correction of error, and personal experience. They tended very often not to claim originality, but rather a kind of conservatism, a fixing of the texts in order to restore them. Some, as I say, justified their action in terms of the discovery of ancient texts. Others use geography as the justification rather than, um, rather than ancient versus modern. For example, the publisher of a Venice 1601 edition, the publisher of a Venice 1601 edition expressed the motivation for his enterprise in terms of dissemination across geographic boundaries and wrote as follows, quote, although these books have already been printed in Lublin with the Sha'are Dura, they have not spread out in the Italian provinces. And even if they have spread into some of our provinces, they are not widely diffuse. Enum mefuzarim umefuradim. Uh, that's a, an excerpt from, um, from the book of Esther, which some of us read not long ago. And, uh, and the printing is erroneous, end quote. I see that some people are writing in to say they've lost sound. Um, uh, is that a, a common theme? Do we have sound here? Abigail, can I just get a uh, thumbs up or down? Are you okay with sound? I'm just working. I'm just going to post Edgar's contact in here again if anybody needs to reach him. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So our apologies to those who are experiencing technical difficulties. I'm going to continue since it sounds like the whole um, on the whole does have audio. So I'm going to carry on. The dissemination, thank you. Thank you to those who, who have written in with the chat. It's so funny to sort of speak into the void. It's nice to have a bit of, uh, a bit of textual feedback along the way uh, so that we, we have a, a modicum or a measure of encounter <laughs> as, as I uh, represent these materials to you. So as I was saying, what I think is so interesting about this Venice text is that the author specifically justified the production because they felt that this Central and Eastern European text had not sufficiently penetrated Italian markets. The dissemination of this work was part of a larger fabric of a rising Eastern European influence over Jewish life, Jewish ritual life in Italy that manifested in a variety of printed works and was spurred in some ways between the coincidence between heightened cultural pressure by the Catholic Church in the Italian peninsula, alongside more favorable cultural conditions in Eastern Europe. But that's only part of the story. 
Whereas the influx of Eastern European authored books penetrated aspects of the Italian market, some figures, some Central European printers attempted to resist the impact of the East. So whereas some Venetian printers wanted Eastern European books to flood their markets, others in the German lands wanted to resist the influence of Polish authorities by adding commentary derived from local custom in order to preserve distinct regional practices in the face of a homogenizing practical handbook. A 1604 work from Prague called Sefer Tikune Zevach reveals some of the tensions at work. The author's text appears to be polemically directed precisely against the addition of that Svi of Krakow, which had dominated the market for the preceding 30 years or so. Adopting a subtly polemical name, uh, Tikune Zevach, the reparation of the sacrifice or fixing the sacrifice. So it's clear that there's a slight polemic here. The author saying, I am here to right some wrongs that have been done. The author aimed to repair the damage done by Tzvi's edition. A running commentary to Vile's text was also accompanied. So the original, um, uh, so Vile's text is in the center of it. A running commentary to Vile's text was accompanied by a series of glosses directly taking on the work of the Krakow Shochet Tzvi under the header Zivche Riv, or Sacrifices of Dispute. The author appears to wish to be invalidating the earlier rulings and to supplant them with his own new edition. And this was not the only such edition produced out of a worry, out of the overwhelming flooding and homogenizing power of Eastern European presses and the authorities they promoted. A 1685 edition from Wilmsdorf, for example, a 1685 edition from Wilhelmsdorf praised Weil's contribution, but worried that Schritotu Vidikot had canonized the customs of Krakow, and the author therefore framed his own work as geared towards salvaging local custom in the face of those homogenizing trends accelerated by the printing press. If guarding local traditions of consumers of meat and the customs they adhere to provided one thread of justification for new editions, another revolved around a consideration of the direct audience. For the books themselves. So if, uh, so let's say if the 1604 text, if the 1685 text were worried about preserving particular kashrut customs, these texts were also worried about the direct audience, the shochtim themselves. The 1604 edition from Prague included an approbation, a letter of commendation by a contemporary rabbi explaining that he had undergone, so this is still the tikkun ezevach that you see in front of you, but there's a little letter of intro at the front of it, by a contemporary rabbi who says, I also played a hand in producing this edition. I helped to revise it in order to shorten the work in the interests of the limited intellectual capacity of the shochti. Now that's very, to me, that's very strange. Uh, since the book was directed to be read by a shochet, it's funny that there's a little uh, backhanded insult that goes to the shochet along the way to say, I don't think they're smart enough to read a longer book, so I've produced a shorter book for them. But, but that's what's happening in the intro to this book here. The limited capacity was also expressed in terms of facility with the language of rabbinic Hebrew. For the Prague 1604 edition included, to the best of my knowledge for the first time, Yiddish, a gesture towards the distinction between the learned scholar who would have been conversant in rabbinic Hebrew and Aramaic and the practical craft of the shochet, who would have been better versed in Yiddish, at least in Central and Eastern Europe, than in the uh, language of the study hall. Yiddish translations continued in further printings of the 17th century, an Amsterdam printing from 1667 and a Wilhelmsdorf edition of 1670. As an indication of the specialist, but not necessarily elevated status of the Shochtim, we might highlight the edition in front of you, a Dierenfurt edition from 1695, which appears in a slim octavo format, which means it's, it's basically the size of a passport, give or take. It's something, it's, it's pocket size. The introduction by the author, Alexander ben Mordechai uh, indicates his intention to provide something portable and light, easy to keep at hand. The edition featured an introduction in Hebrew and then a second lengthier one in Yiddish, the vernacular language that the publisher expected would be better understood by a shoichet, who was something between a scholar and a craftsman. The skill of the butcher was in his hands, not his intellect. The text of the volume itself, which is only, um, only about 12 pages in length, 
um, features a running side-by-side -side translation from Weil's Hebrew text into Yiddish, apparently suggesting that the Shofet is not even fully expected to be able to understand the Hebrew. Yiddish editions like this one uh, continued. A 1784 printing in Bamberg anticipated that the audience Hold off on this for a moment. A 1784 uh, edition from Bomberg anticipated the audience would be not urban but rural, addressing itself to quote those in villages and towns who do not understand the holy tongue, suggesting a kind of um, linguistic, uh, a kind of linguistic split between Jews who live in larger spaces where they are more proximate to yeshivot, for example, or Jewish males who are more proximate to yeshivot, and those who are more remote, who are expected to be conversant in Yiddish and presumably in the local vernacular as well. But in this case, the language is produced for them or the documents are produced for them in Yiddish because they're expected not to understand the holy tongue. Moreover, an edition of this sort, the, the 1695 one that you see in front of you, also had a numbered digest of laws, a sort of checklist to make sure that all aspects of the process were covered. Uh, this edition from, from 95 is the first that I know of that has a numbered checklist. It kind of represents a new, I don't quite want to call it a technology, but a new technique in bookmaking of numbering, of list making, of itemizing, something we're, of course, so familiar in our time with tables of contents, but, but this handy digest or list also represents a new way of organizing knowledge. A later edition from 1759 printed in Amsterdam similarly appears in Yiddish, uh, this time not even bothering to offer an introduction about the need for Yiddish. It takes it as a given. And a, six, a 1762 Amsterdam edition explicitly positions the book for use by rural Jews who lack other guidance, really kind of directing it towards a sort of DIY, a do-it-yourself use. So we're seeing these different editions um, oscillate between different poles, some of them demanding that uh, oversight or authority by learned rabbis, others saying, with this book, you should have everything you need in order to provide kosher food for uh, the Jews of the side. Uh, I see an interesting question has come up about women performing shrita, and I'd be delighted to return to that as we, as we move to the questions. Uh, I'm so happy when a question like that comes up. So we'll, we'll get into some of that a little bit later on. Whereas the vast majority of these handbooks printed for ritual slaughter were designed for Jewish readers and practitioners, still other editions were produced not to promote the craft, but to undermine it. In the 17th and 18th centuries, a number of Christian Hebraists undertook to translate, explicate, and most importantly, expose the purported secrets that underlay the practices of ritual slaughter as rooted in Jewish chauvinism and as a sinister insult against majority Christian society. The scholar Jakob Deutsch has argued that publications of this nature were a piece with a larger strand of polemical ethnographies, whose primary purpose was to rail against Jewish practices by imputing sinister motives to religious observances. Thus, a German work entitled Schritotu Vidikot was produced in the year 1677, which polemically undertook to unmask Jewish practices as superstitious, stupid, and malicious. Another German language edition intended for a non-Jewish readership was produced in 1724, directed towards exposing Jews' purported immorality as reflected in their slaughtering practices. And I'm sure some of you know uh, that, that to this day, um, Every couple of years in different European nations, the, the question of shrita uh, emerges again, um, coupled with questions of circumcision, for example. Um, there are brilliant books that have been written about this for the modern period, which is why I'm relegating uh, or really keeping my efforts to a previous one. Now, the sheer volume of the publication of handbooks for slaughtering raises important questions about their role in the training of an individual. Or put differently, how did one learn this profession? And what roles did these books play in the process? A number of the publishers of these books did not shy away from highlighting the differences between the scholar and the practitioner. As I noted before, at least one of the endorsers of one edition expressed the merit of the work as it was geared towards Shochtim, quote, whose intellect was limited. 
And indeed, Bile's text is not quite a do-it-yourself manual. Mingling Hebrew with Aramaic, the text does not quite move step by step. It's not a, it's not a simple DIY manual. So who was this intended audience? Although I just pointed out to you or said that, that um, works by Christians um, could be motivated or often were motivated by a particular anti-Jewish animus, I think they can also be valuable sources for recovering aspects of Jewish practice. The most comprehensive of these were the observations of Johann Buchstorf, whose Synagoga Judaica was built upon earlier German language observations of Jewish practice written by Christians, as well as Jewish texts. Um, on the screen in front of you, you can see an English language translation of the work, and I'm going to read you just an excerpt of it, which says, quote, Many among the Jews are forced to learn the butcher's trade, which they call shachten. He that learns it is bound as an apprentice to some skillful butcher for a term of years. And those are not a few, for there are so many precepts, constitutions, caveats, axioms belonging thereunto, that it is very difficult for any man in a short time to be cunning an expert therein. He must therefore bestow great pains in study and seeking the rules appertaining thereunto out of the books of the rabbis, that thereby he may gain a perfect and found knowledge therein. Bookstart noted the importance of book learning and was attentive to the novel genre for the book. He writes, there is extant a certain small pamphlet, which is called Shochichtus and Bedikus, the butcher's book. In which are contained, that, that's not me mispronouncing uh, it, that's, that's how he spells it, uh, the butcher's book, in which are contained the principal rules and canons belonging to this art according to the tenor whereof the Jews at this day kill and slaughter their beasts and other cattle. If they meet with any difficult places, uh, this shows true meaning cannot be comprehended by the brains of the butcher, they repair to some rabbi for the exposition thereof. Given the fact that the circumstances of production adopted technical experience rather than intellectual ability, and mingled craft apprenticeship with secondary reliance on a printed handbook, it's not surprising the traces of technical know-how and personal intervention appear as handwritten interventions into some surviving copies. While certainly not all copies have inscriptions within them, some have copious marginal notes, while others are as pristine as the day they were first printed, a variety of personalizations distinguish the copies from each other. Two kinds of inscriptions might be of interest to us. One in which the author specifically indicates that he has studied the text, and another in which others certify that the author has successfully completed a course of study and can legitimately practice his craft. The first reflects the author using the book as a personal record as students personalize their books and inscribe their experience into the material artifact. And I'm gonna show you a few on the screen now. Um, some of them simply have the name. Uh, you can see on the item in front of you, there's a small signature up there. Others, um, others have uh, quite, uh, quite fancy um, embossed cover pages. Um, others of them have only very small marginal notes in the bottom of them. This one reads in the bottom, Ube Prague Nohaginan Shetrefa. In Prague, I assume that the owner of it was a Prague, uh, was a Prague Jew. Right here in Prague, our custom is that what is elsewhere considered kosher is here considered not kosher. Um, here at the bottom of the screen below you, uh, you can also see inscriptions that are left there. But the one that I am most excited about uh, is, the, is the item. Uh, this is actually the one that got me excited about this entire project to begin with. It set me down this path. Um, you can see. Uh, you can see marginalia and other inscriptions on the item before you. And if you look at the image on the bottom left, what I think I see going on there um, are the doodles by a presumably somewhat bored student. This is from an item that is preserved in the Oppenheim collection of the Bodley Library. Uh, and what I think is happening is I think this is a doodle of a chicken conducting shrita on a cow. I think that a uh, that a student that was perhaps bored in class has, has produced a little doodle on the side whereby they are drawing pictures of what it must be like to, to make kosher meat. I'll leave that up for, for a moment as I, as I take you through some of, the, uh, some of the other elements of it. 
in, in, in other texts, sometimes the, the writing, sometimes these manuscript interventions um, can be about a kind of personal history. Uh, I've got, um, I examined a book uh, that I believe was in the New York Public Library, if I'm not mistaken. Just check my notes. Yeah, an item in the New York Public Library, for example, from Hesse, from Michelstadt in Hesse, tells the story by a shochet um, about uh, the one time that he was conducting shrita and was perplexed to find organs not intact. And so he left a kind of note to self about, um, about his experience on that count. Now, although inscriptions are hardly a novelty in printed books, I suspect that many of us who are, who are here in the crowd today have written in books ourselves. It appears to me that also handwritten inscriptions by people other than the owners themselves tells us something interesting about the transit of knowledge between the professional and the personal. In a number of copies of books, it was not the inscription of the owner that mattered, but rather handwritten licenses of approval by outside authorities who tested the shochet and certified his skill. In fact, this, this may even be a response to one of the questions that has just come into me. So somebody has asked, what kind of training did they go through? And so here is part of the answer. In a number of printed books, we see handwritten inscriptions that transform the printed book into a kind of personal credential for the bearer of the object, who could now present it as material evidence of knowledge acquired. The certification of a shochet appears to have developed over centuries and moved from a form of oral permission by reputation and word of mouth to a textualized certification in writing. A tradition of oversight was present in looser forms from early centuries. We know from at least as early as 1220 that a German synod demanded that slaughtering not take place without first a kind of system of examination of the person doing the shrita. In the second half of the 15th century, a scholar wrote about the practice not to rely on shrita until the shochet has permission from a scholar who investigated and interrogated him in the laws of Shrita and in front of whom he slaughters three birds. The Ashkenazic glosses to the Shulchan Aruch reflect the textualization of this process, not just a face-to-face -face testing process, but a documentary process as well. The, um, the author of the glosses on the Shulchan Aruch writes, the Shochet himself shall not conduct Shrita, even if he knows the laws of Shrita and his provision until he has done shrita three times in front of a learned man and one that is proficient in the laws of shrita, therefore we practice that a man shall not shecht without having obtained kabbalah, without having obtained approval or permission from before a learned one. And the learned one should not give kabbalah until he knows that the shochet knows the laws of shrita and is proficient with his hands. The one who received kabbalah, the one who receives approval, also gets a written letter from the learned one as proof that he has given him Kabbalah. Indeed, Bookstore observed a similar rule in practice, noting he who has diligently perused this little book is made by some of the and is made by some of the rabbis a freeman of this company, receives a testimonial letter under the hand and seal of his skill and ability, wherein it is certified that he is expert and skillful in the butcher's trade. Bookstore for Marx, it was my chance to see one of these testimonials, which was written in manner and form following. This day being such and such of the month and such and such a year, I have examined and in examining found so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, to be skillful. And the letter continues like that. These written texts developed a documentary life of their own. Um, now, licenses for Shrita, ah, okay, licenses for Shrita um, could sometimes be elegantly illustrated and sometimes they could be quite simple. Um, here is a license for Shrita from Carpentras in 1764 from the Columbia University Libraries. Um, some of them could be very lovely individual pages, but what I think is just as interesting is that more often than not, they can be found not in separate documents, but integrated into the handbooks of technical expertise themselves. Or codifiers, decisors, and contemporary witnesses spoke for a need for official permission, 
we can see in documents like this, we can see in surviving books that, that scholars write in the blank spaces, I have on day so-and-so inspected so-and-so and found that person worthy. And so it's not the author writing in his own book, but rather authorities, almost like signing a yearbook at the end of a semester, uh, it is authorities inscribing in these books licenses. These inscriptions thus bound together print and manuscript, technical knowledge, book learning with performed skill and examination, and authoritative approval with individual ability. Here is an inscription uh, from the year 1605 in a 1577 book. So, so the date of the inscription is later than the publication of the book. On the final pages of the Bibicot, it reads, uh, on Thursday, the 29th of Cheshvan, Shimon ben Levi came before me and, uh, and practiced the Bibicot as they were established by our master, Jacob Weil. I found him expert in all of the laws and the, um, and the testimony of Rabbi Jacob ben Solomon, the examiner of the holy community of Frankfurt was given before me because he is expert. Uh, and as a testimony, uh, I gave permission for him to inspect like all the experts in Israel. And I placed upon him the instruction that he should repeat these chapters or study these chapters once a day over the course of two months and once a month for the rest of his life as a testimony and a proof I have written and signed thus Samuel of Frankfurt. It appears that the very permission depended on the oral exam, the testimony of an expert, and then this license. And these licenses for shechita were open documents evolving and subject to renewal. Um, apologies, this, this is the slide I, I should have shown you just now. This is a 1601 Basel text with, um, with a much later signature, in, or rather signature just five years later in it. Uh, here are inscriptions from a text printed in Krakow in 1577 that received recertification every couple of years. A signature is there from the year 1690, another from the year 1696, another from the year 1703. All of the signatures are from the same place, and it seems that, it, that what had happened in this situation is that as different specialists passed through town in Stadthagen in northern Germany, the bearer of this book used it as an opportunity to get himself recertified. Um, so there, there's something happening here um, with, uh, with these sort of traveling authorities. Now, although the preceding example suggests that the Shochet was stationary, whereas his authoritative examiners were mobile, it's clear both from the printed matter and from accompanying paratextual inscriptions that Shochim could be on the move as well. One Shochet manual makes this abundantly clear as the owner inscribed a wayfarer's prayer, Tfilah Haderech, into the blank fly leaves at the end of his copy. And communal leaders worked to control the contours of this system. The regulation of super communal organization of the Jews of Moravia, for example, wrote, uh, let's see. My apologies, my apologies, I'm not sure why it's missing, but the regulations of the super communal organization of the Jews of Moravia states, the rabbis are obligated to oversee the slaughterers and inspectors to ensure um, whether they are expert by hand and mouth and not to rely on the approval that they already have at hand. So there's, there's a fear here. And in any event, every half year, the rabbis are obligated to oversee, to ask and inspect in the community, and no slaughterer and inspector is permitted to issue a Kabbalah, even if he is an expert. The Kabbalah must specifically be issued by a rabbi in the community. We recognize a kind of tug of war here between the individual rabbis and shochets leaving their mark on this particular book, and efforts by larger communal organizations to domesticate this practice, to not allow individual rogue rabbis to authenticate, but rather to, uh, to create a kind of system of set law for how this might work. And we might actually contextualize this practice within the wider world of authentication that gained currency in early modern Europe with the introduction of passports, border checks, and the larger set of relations between documents and the people that bore them. Every early modern document of authentication had to bridge the gap between the person and their representation on paper. And the purpose of these writings was to give information about someone, not because the person was absent, but rather because the person was right there. Who are you? 
um, in travel documents of the period issued by territorial authorities. Uh, the authenticity of these documents rested upon signs and symbols beyond the word, wax seals bearing the icons of the issuing authority, for example. For the rabbinic signatories to these documents, however, it was their hand alone that was supposed to suffice to vouch for the qualifications of their bearer, which means that sometimes they could produce false replications of those certifications and sometimes imposter shochtim. The dream with which I opened this lecture, or, or perhaps shall we call it a nightmare, cut to the quick of an important aspect of early modern Jewish life, the question about trust and reliability. To return to that episode, Pinchas Katz and Ellen Bogen in the year 1730 dreamed that his town shochet was lacking, yet the material evidence in front of him suggested that all was, shall we say, kosher. Katzen Ellen Bogan wrote in 1730 that the same butcher's credentials had been called into question by a scholar in the community who refused to eat the product of this man's shrita, and that at the time the leadership of the community responded with what our witness calls naivete and says, but is not this butcher established as kosher? He has the kabbalot of rabbis who preceded him, and he already has been established in his kosher status for the course of three years. In response to the repeated objections raised by the butcher's challenge, Katzenellen Bogan summons the accused Shochet and his accuser to Katzenellen Bogan's seat of justice in Markbright for a hearing. Although Katzenellen Bogan was unable to marshal sufficient evidence against the butcher, and even his gentle entreaties to the Shochet to resign fell on, on um, deaf ears, it was only with the dream of the taunted dog and a book that explained the meaning of the commandments and the punishment for their violation, that Katzen Ellenbogen could finally rest assured that he was dealing with an imposter. Although the butcher stood firm in his objections, Katzen Ellenbogen admonished him to beware that God knows the secrets of the hearts of humans and reported of his dream. Taken aback, the accused Shochet relented and consented to cease of all future activities as a butcher. An important upshot of Katzenelenbogen's narrative then is the fact that although Kabbalot appeared, although these licenses for Shrita appear at face value to be trustworthy signs of certification, the truth behind them was far more complicated and appearances can be deceiving. An act of divine intervention revealed information hidden from the naked eye, but the, informa the information that ultimately vitiated the standards of the Kabbalot's authors and unmask their bearer as unfaithful to his certification. In Katzenelm Bogan's system of authentication, the oral and supernatural bore as much weight as the documentary and the rational systems of information and record keeping. And it is worth noting as well that in Katzenelm and Bogan's telling, the story has a happy ending as divine intervention unmasks the fraud and saves the day. Perhaps looking at the clock, uh, Katzenelm Bogan's tale is a fitting place to close our investigation for now for the precise reason that it highlights the hybrid character of authority over kosher meat between the written and the experienced. The manuscript, Kabbalah, or certification mediated between the individual expertise associated with book learning and print on the one hand, and traditions of oral transmission and group control associated with face-to-face -face instruction and certification. These authenticating documents were fraught by their inherent instability and the potential for forgery and appear to have been negotiated within changing communal contexts and with agents whom at once sought to enforce their power and competed to control them. And with that, I think we'll pause so that we can, we can explore questions and, and discuss a bit. So thank you, Joshua, for your fascinating lecture. I would like to thank Dr. Berkovich, a professor at HUC for helping to organize the lecture. So now Dr. Berkovich will moderate the questions. So AJ. Apparently, I need to unmute AJ. So just... oh, there we go. Perfect. Yes. So um, thank you for unmuting me. And now I have the floor. 
Um, I, I'd first like to begin by thanking Professor Toplitsky for an amazing, incredible, and insightful lecture. I have learned a tremendous amount. I, I would also like to thank uh, my partner in crime, Jean Marie Musto, for, uh, for well, literally being my partner in crime. This would not have happened without her, and of course not without HUC and, and BSA, so, so thank you all for making this happen. Um, there are several questions that came into the chat, and I see some people's hands, so I'm going to try to use the limited amount of time here to combine some questions, moderate them, and ask Professor Toplitsky to respond. Um, one group of questions has to do with the uh, physical artifact, the material, the text itself, um, and they are, um, were any of the manuals illustrated, other than you know the, the wonderful doodles that we saw, what might these illustrations have looked like? And was the practice of, of travering, namely cutting up the sciatic nerve, also described in, in these particular books? An excellent, an excellent, excellent question. Um, by and large, they are not particularly, uh, particularly illustrated. The printed ones in particular are not particularly illustrated. The sole illustrations that appear in the printed editions are usually of knives, or the knives themselves, so that the shochet can examine the knife and figure out if that knife is suitable for use. If it has nicks in it, for example, if it has a nick or damage, that would make it, um, that would make it disqualified for use. Uh, there is in the in the Columbia manuscript that I showed on the screen from 1764, if I'm not mistaken, it's from that manuscript. Some manuscripts include a kind of um, flayed vision of the animal body so that the organs can be displayed. But the printed material, interestingly, does not tend to include that. Um, and, and as you've seen here, my goal was to largely talk about the way print matter gets re-inscribed. Um, if we had an extra hour, I would take us into the manuscript material as well. Um, thank you. Uh, librarian Michelle uh, Chesner writes in to say, to correct me, that it's a different manuscript. There are two with images, um, and that's, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and as Abigail will, will be able to point out there, I think we're going to be able to see some images or increasing images from HUC will, will be lasting for people to, to get a look at. They've been digitized and so they will at some point, I hope be available for people to see. And in those you'll be able to see the images of the knives um, as well, uh, which, which sort of just lend part of a sense of the visual or pictorial representational elements in these books. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so two more questions, one related to good old causal history and another related to social history, which you were clearly excited to answer before. Um, the first uh, by, by Jody Myers is, um, I've learned that from, from food historians that because of the huge population loss during the Black Death, areas for pasture land increased during the 1500s and 1600s, and that European people experienced a surplus of beef. May this not also have been a factor in the increased number of Shkita manuals? So that's the sort of causal historical question. And then, of course, the social historical question about the excess of beef. Were women permitted to perform shkita? If so, under what circumstances? Great questions. Both, both excellent questions. Now, I'm afraid that, um, that I, I unfortunately do not know very much. Well, there, I mean, you could fill a library with the things I don't know. There are so many things that, that I, I don't know. But luckily, we have libraries. Uh, so that there's always more room to learn. I, I don't know much about the excess of beef there. Um, I, I have done a little bit of investigating uh, about women conducting shrita. Um, I'm just going to pull up um, my notes so that I can, I can find all of that for us. Um, the evidence that I have had the good fortune to encounter about women has largely been in the Italian peninsula. Um, the uh, about women doing shrita themselves. Uh, I'm just going to ask you for a moment so I can make sure that I that I get you all the correct information. It, it seems that um, there are in fact even surviving shrita um, in, uh, certificates for women that come from the Italian peninsula. Um, these can be ah yes okay. Uh, there's a there's a comment that's that's coming up on the side. Um, there are, if people want to see inscriptions, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get my hands on these, but there are licenses for women to do shrita in Italy, uh, particularly in country manners and in the Italian countryside. And there's a beautiful book that was edited by Sharon Lieberman Mintz, um, oh, it was probably, it was probably 10 plus years ago, that includes within it rep reproductions of treasures from the Jewish Theological Seminary, including licenses for 
women to conduct shrita. Um, so that's uh, that as part of the answer. Uh, and of course, women also played a significant role in other parts of the koshering process, which was uh, the salting of meat, etc. cetera. Um, so that sort of salting to remove the blood from meat in, in customs books that are printed in the latter half of the 17th century, even within the Ashkenazic purview, um, often the authors will talk about the duty of a head of household to ensure that the members of the household, both men and women, are well versed in the practice of the salting of meat in order to ensure that the family is well fed. So that's, that's a later stage in the ritual economy of meat production, um, but certainly we have some instances of women's involvement as well. Perfect. Um, and then two questions um, by Martin um, Boworski. I'm sorry if I butchered that name, I apologize. Um, so what do we know about butchering in the general non-Jewish community, right? So I'm, I'm reframing the question a bit. So um, to what degree do, do, does the Guild of Shritot mirror or not mirror butchering guilds if they existed? Um, and then part two is, was, was the technical, was the certification for Shritot a, a, a just a technical certification or did it also attest to the proper religious observance and behavior of the Shritot, the, the religious technical and the religious piety? Very, very valuable questions, very, very valuable questions. Um, I fear at this stage, I still do not know enough about the entire world of, of meat producing guilds. Um, <laughs> I wish I could let you in on how long the draft of this talk was before I, <laughs> before I, I cut down elements from it. Um, but but it's, it's, a, it's a deeply valuable question, something that uh, requires much further investigation on my part, and I'm very appreciative of it. Um, the certification process itself relates primarily only to the narrow technical ability in the language that I have seen so far. There's, there's a measure of, so again, that, that's just in the license itself. Um, as, as we've seen, the sort of larger supportive texts talk about um, the kind of person the shochet has to be. The inscription itself is, is, quite, um, is quite narrow and focused and says, I saw this person conduct this. Sometimes it doesn't even say that much. Sometimes it's just a signature by somebody else. It says, I saw this person conduct this, and therefore I have added my name and my signature. Sometimes it says, I've seen the signatures of others, and therefore I add mine to theirs as well. So it's really quite a very, very narrow sort of inscription. That you're Fantastic. And I think, um, Yoram, you have the, uh, the last question. You're on mute, you're on. No, no, uh, thank you, AJ. No, I don't have a question, but uh, I, me I meant that we should have another question, one more question and we'll wrap up. Fantastic, so I, I, I will take the- I, I, I do wanna draw, AJ, if I can, I do wanna draw our attention to just, there's, there's beautiful stuff happening in the chat box on the side where where colleagues from all kinds of different libraries, from Columbia University, from the University of Pennsylvania, are sharing beautiful um, links to, um, to different digitized materials. That's one of the treats of being in, a, in, a, in an online audience, that people in real time can, can collaborate, can share, can display. Um, there's all kinds of great stuff happening on the side there. So I do recommend that people scroll through in order to click on these links and to, to see some of the treasures of collections um, that I perhaps have not even had the chance to see. Okay. Sure. So um, as, as the, I will take the final question myself. I noticed that with regards to Shrita and Bizikot, um, a number of the books on top read Zivchu Zivchei Tzedek. So I'm curious if you could speak to um, the, the use of that versus, you know, there's, there's a little bit of an obvious because it has to do with slaughter. Um, when does it first appear? I'm curious if there's a you know, veiled polemic. Uh, the, the next line is Bitchu Badonai. Uh, have faith in God. So I mean, maybe I'm overreading when I say that, you know, the Zivchu Zivchei Tzedek is, you know, a little uh, you know, jab to the butchers, you know, make sure you do this properly. I'm curious if you could speak to you know, the verse that you use and maybe just relate that to the use of verses and, you know, frontispieces in general. Sure. Um, I can't say that I have a lot to say about it. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, the first time that it appears is already as early as the Krakow 1577 edition. I think that is the first time that it comes with it, which means it's the it's the one with the, which is the the first instance of the super commentary, or rather the commentary gloss uh, that that emerges out of Krakow there. 
Um, it's a great question, MJ. I, I don't, uh, I'll have to think, I'll have to think more deeply about it. But, but I can tell you that, that, to the best of my knowledge, the first instance of it is 1577. Some editions have it, some do not, but I think it kind of gives this, um, it sort of takes the vile text and, and indicates the accretion of this new layer to it. That's just sort of off the top of my head. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Kleski, for an incredibly insightful, wonderful, and engaging lecture today. Um, Yaron? OK, again, thank you. AJ, and thank you uh, again. Thank you, Joshua, for your fascinating lecture. Uh, I would like also to thank the, Dr. Jordan Thinking and the rest of the library staff for their support. So thank you and have a good afternoon. Abigail? Um, yes, and we just want to thank the US Bank, uh, one of our corporate sponsors and our various other partners. It is thanks to them that we have this wonderful presentation and thank you, Dr. Tchaikovsky for bringing us all together and sharing your work with us. And lastly, if you'd like to stay connected to us, we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please join the HUC Connect initiative to support the HUC JIR mission, which is preparing the next generation of Jewish leaders. So thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time.